11. Elder the thought shaping technology, in essence, was a potent form of dark technology. It manipulated human minds through mechanical implants, solidifying specific beliefs. The human brain was a marvel of complexity, with various neural pathways responsible for distinct functions. Specific areas governed judgment and critical thinking. For instance, the proposition water is poisonous would trigger a cascade of evaluations, the type of water, its contents, before a conclusion was formed. The intricate process of thought and decision making was a hallmark of human sentience. The thought shaping technology bypassed these processes, delivering predetermined answers. When specific information entered the brain, targeted manipulation of specific neural networks produced an uncritical acceptance of the information as truth. In simpler terms, an individual implanted with the water is poisonous thought shaping would inherently believe all water to be toxic. Given the Imperium's labyrinthine structure and the singularity of his own situation, a time-traveling Primarch, Gilliman saw the thought-shaping technology as a necessary evil. He was forced to choose a side, and humanity was the only viable option. The Emperor, while on the side of humanity, might not necessarily be on Gilliman's side. The possibility of the Emperor perceiving him as a threat, a time-traveling anomaly, loomed large. Being captured on terror would be a death sentence. The Imperial Guard, indoctrinated with unwavering loyalty to the Emperor, would eliminate Gilliman in a heartbeat if ordered. Furthermore, there were those within the Imperium, conservatives and traditionalists, who vehemently opposed Gilliman's reforms to the bloated Imperial bureaucracy. Some had already risen in rebellion, refusing to submit to Terra's authority. These dissenters were potential threats. The ever-present threat of chaos added another layer of complexity. Gilliman couldn't rely on chaos-tainted weaponry, yet the Imperium lacked the capacity for independent production. He needed a trump card a way to instill unwavering loyalty and hatred for chaos within his recruits. The thought-shaping technology, coupled with a loyalty program that superseded even the Emperor's authority, would provide him with an edge. Even if the Emperor turned against him, Gilliman could potentially carve out a separate domain, free from Terra's control. Kaya, his advanced cognitive core struggling to process the implications, stared at the enigmatic smile playing on Gilliman's lips. He had reviewed the data storage and understood the power and potential dangers of the thought-shaping technology. Regent, he began, his voice laced with trepidation, this thought-shaping technology. Kaya's hesitation was evident. Was unleashing such a technology truly the best course of action? Gilliman, anticipating his reservations, cut him off. You're aware of the dire situation the Imperium faces, Kaya, ten thousand years after its founding, it's on the back foot against chaos, steadily weakening. We're far worse off than during the Great Crusade. How can we possibly overcome this escalating war? Humanity faces complete annihilation by chaos if we don't take drastic measures. Desperate times call for desperate measures, Gilliman continued, his voice low and urgent. We need an army utterly loyal to mankind and the Imperium, one that obeys our orders and adheres to our ideology without question. You've witnessed the corruption plaguing Terra's bureaucracy and the ossified rigidity of the Mechanicus. Without change. How can we possibly hope to vanquish the horrors of chaos? Gilliman omitted the hidden agenda twisting his resolve, his own uncertain position within the Imperium. The truth, the burden of his time travel, was a secret he couldn't share. But the potential threat from a wary emperor necessitated an army unquestionably loyal to him. Chaos brow furrowed, his mechanical eyes flickering with an indecipherable light. A tense silence hung in the air before he finally spoke. I will fulfill your request, Regent, he said, bowing in submission. The whirring of his machinery served as a grim accompaniment. A satisfied smile spread across Gilliman's face. Excellent. Proceed with the task at hand. I eagerly await the arrival of this army. It's crucial for stabilizing the current chaos plaguing the Imperium. With the Magos settled, Gilliman turned his attention to the next pressing matter, the alien army known as the Death Guard. He summoned their leaders, Vrain and Visage, for a crucial face-to-face -face meeting. The Imperium had a long history of xenophobia, and the people of Ultramar were no exception. The presence of an alien force within their domain was bound to raise suspicion and mistrust. Before leading his own troops to purge the remaining chaos stained from the Ultramar worlds, Gilliman had to address this potential powder keg, the Death Guard. This wasn't a conventional Imperial force, but an army belonging to the Elder, an ancient alien race. Their motives for aiding Kaya, Celestine, and the others in Gilliman's resurrection remained shrouded in mystery. While their assistance had been invaluable, Gilliman couldn't simply overlook their alien nature. The Elder were an ethereal race, 
their slender forms vaguely resembling humans but with pointed ears and an air of otherworldly grace. Their beauty was undeniable, almost unsettling in its perfection. Gilliman couldn't help but notice their impossibly thin waists, wondering if they could even bear the weight of their armor. Enough formalities, Gilliman said, gesturing for them to rise as they entered and bowed in respect. Let's speak plainly. I have a number of questions that require your answers. He couldn't ignore the critical role the Elder played in the rise of Slanesh, one of the four Chaos Gods. The Elder were an ancient people, rumored to have participated in the legendary war in heaven. After their creator's demise and the slumber of their Necron enemies, they had ascended to the position of galactic overlords, ushering in an era of unparalleled prosperity. However, this very prosperity proved to be their undoing. They succumbed to a gradual moral decay, drowning themselves in an endless pursuit of pleasure. Their entire civilization became consumed by hedonism, a decadent spectacle that birthed Slanesh, the embodiment of excess. The Elder's story was a cautionary tale. Their unbridled indulgence birthed Slanesh, a chaos god fueled by their hedonism. The birth of this evil entity triggered a cataclysmic warp storm, causing the Elder Empire to implode. Countless Elder souls were devoured by the nascent Slanesh, and their pantheon of gods either crumbled or fell prisoner. Only the Elder with foresight or those who sought refuge in alternate realities managed to survive. However, their once formidable psychic power and technology remained a force to be reckoned with. Vrain and Visage, leading the Death Guard, had aided Kea and Celestin in rescuing Gilliman from the clutches of Chaos and facilitating their escape to Macrag. The tapestry of stars is in tatters, Vrain declared, her voice resonating with urgency. A ghastly doom looms over the galaxy. Once the power of chaos breaches the warp's hold, the entire galaxy will descend into pandemonium. I am most pleased that our two races can forge an alliance in the face of this crisis. Gilliman acknowledged their alliance with polite diplomacy. He recognized the value of their assistance against the ever-present threat of chaos. However, Vrain's next words carried a veiled warning. Chaos technology, while effective in restoring his physical form, had left a profound psychic scar. The true essence of his resurrection hinged on the power of the Death God. If he wished to experience true life, he had to remain encased within his armor, a constant reminder of his dependence. The Elder Leader chose not to delve deeper into the source of his resurrection, but her warning was clear, sincere human connection was paramount. Employing manipulative tactics would only erode the fragile trust humans had extended towards them. The implication was chilling, a future confrontation where their alliance could crumble and blades might clash. Gilliman, however, remained undeterred. His resurrection was a reality. The Recover Data and Control template provided him with the tools to navigate this new reality. He offered a veiled threat of his own, if the Elder strayed, they would face the consequences. We take your caution to heart, Vrain replied, her tone carefully neutral. May our paths continue as allies when we next cross. A formal farewell concluded their meeting. Visage, who had remained silent throughout, presented Gilliman with a warrior's gift before following Varane in their departure. A wave of exhaustion washed over Gilliman. The universe, he realized, was a haven for monstrous entities. Survival demanded cunning and intellect. The Elder, despite their precarious alliance, were no fools. With the matter of the Elder settled, Gilliman summoned the planetary governors and trade guild leaders who had been awaiting his audience. The time had come to address them and set his plan for the Imperium's salvation into motion. 12. Fractured loyalty in a decaying emperor 500 Ultramar worlds were the crown jewels of the Imperium. Here, public order reigned supreme, and living standards surpassed those found on most Imperial planets. During the Horus Heresy, the bitter civil war that nearly tore the Imperium apart, Gilliman had envisioned these worlds as a potential fallback position. He even contemplated establishing a second empire with his loyal brothers, but that plan was shelved upon learning of the Emperor's survival. Even as an unrealized concept, the idea highlighted the immense potential of Ultramar. These worlds were Gilliman's bedrock, his foundation upon which he would rebuild. News of his resurrection had drawn a mixed response. Some capable planetary governors and enterprising rogue traders, loyal and resourceful individuals, responded swiftly. Others, however, remained trapped by the chaos plaguing their territories, or simply refused to acknowledge the authority of a resurrected Primarch. Ten thousand years had wrought significant changes. The Emperor and the Primarchs, once revered figures, had faded into myth. The Imperial Truth, the doctrine emphasizing reason and scientific inquiry, had been relegated to the dustbins of history, replaced by the increasingly dominant state religion. The once cooperative Mechanicum had become insular and dogmatic, while the Terror Council, 
the governing body on terror, wallowed in bureaucratic lethargy. The recent fall of Cadia, a critical world guarding the rift between Railspace and the Warp, had served as a stark reminder of the Imperium's vulnerability. The vast empire, bled dry by a thousand conflicts, struggled to react effectively. Ten millennia had allowed various factions to sink their roots deep within the Imperium, feeding off its resources like parasites. Those who resisted Gilliman's resurgence were these entrenched entities, unwilling to relinquish their perceived birthright, power and control. For now, Gilliman chose to bypass them. His focus was on the loyal worlds of Ultramar, the foundation upon which he would build his strength. Here, he would enact sweeping reforms. Population optimization, he envisioned a system of mandatory military service, ensuring a steady stream of soldiers for his planned campaigns. Food and weapon production, increased production of food and weapons would bolster Ultramar's self-sufficiency in warfighting capabilities. Administrative streamlining, the bloated bureaucracy and the aristocratic system would be trimmed, freeing up resources and improving efficiency. Education reform, promoting widespread education was crucial to fostering innovation and reducing dependence on the increasingly unreliable mechanicum. Independent research, establishing a research infrastructure independent of the mechanicum would provide a critical alternative source of technological advancements. The alliance with the mechanicum was a fragile one, they merely occupied a seat on the Terror Council. Unlike the Emperor, Gilliman lacked the absolute authority to keep the Adeptus Mechanicus in check. Should the Emperor return and brand him a traitor, the loyalty of the Mechanicum would be put to a critical test, would they side with the Omnissire, their machine god, or the resurrected Primarch? The dilemma was clear. While some within the Mechanicum might choose to side with him, they'd likely be a minority. Establishing his own scientific research institution was paramount. It needed a comprehensive system to digest the vast knowledge stored in his database. To achieve this, the cooperation of the assembled planetary governors was crucial. Gilliman, a primarch born under the crimson light of war, found the existence of these aristocratic families above the commoners abhorrent. However, the complexity of this world far exceeded anything he'd known. Despite being a time traveler, his primarch status and the ruling template granted him unimaginable abilities. Yet, absolute control over every world remained an impossible dream. The vastness of the Imperium, coupled with inefficient communication and navigation technologies, made it a logistical nightmare. Additionally, there weren't any sufficiently powerful AI systems available. Chaos, the embodiment of evil, could corrupt not just flesh and blood, but infiltrate networks as well. The sophisticated AI systems prevalent in his world were out of the question here. A single, central AI controlling too many combat units would be disastrous. Under the influence of chaos gods, flesh-eating viruses and demons could infiltrate the network, turning human-controlled units against themselves. The limitations of this universe necessitated granting a degree of autonomy to each colonized planet. The position of planetary governor, with all its inherent power, couldn't be disregarded. Another critical factor was the rogue trader. Their history stretched back to the Great Crusade ten millennia ago. Since the Emperor's first rogue trader patent, these individuals had played a vital role on the galactic stage. Responsible for intergalactic trade, they even possessed the authority to deal with alien species amassing unimaginable wealth. Some rogue trader dynasties spanned dozens, even hundreds of galaxies, a testament to their immense power. They followed the Imperial Navy where it dared to tread, and ventured beyond, exploring uncharted territories where the Emperor's astronomic and beacon couldn't reach. They salvaged wrecks from forgotten wars, unearthed lost relics of humanity's golden age, and facilitated trade with aliens in regions far removed from the Emperor's light. This enterprising group played a crucial role in the Imperium's economy, generating massive tax revenues that fueled the vast legions and bureaucracies. Without their assistance, Gilliman would be left with the daunting task of raising funds himself. The Ultramarines under his command were far too busy defending the Imperium to dabble in commerce. Their unwavering focus lay on combating alien threats and the ever-present corruption of chaos. In the Grand Hall, a well-dressed Zilla and his fellow planetary governors and rogue traders pledged their loyalty to Gilliman. Seated at the head of the round table, the Primarch remained unmoved by their declarations. He rapped his knuckles on the table, his voice echoing in the vast chamber as he began to speak slowly. I require a parliament, Gilliman declared, his gaze sweeping across the assembled crowd. This body will be instrumental in implementing my policies and enforcing my will. His words resonated through the Grand Hall, leaving a heavy silence in their wake. He needed more than just loyalty, he needed a collaborative effort to translate his vision into reality. The upcoming conquest wasn't just about claiming worlds, 
it was about transforming them according to his ideals. This approach, however, wasn't without its risks. Imposing reforms across the vast imperium would inevitably draw the ire of entrenched interests, the Terror Council, the Insula Mechanicum, regional nobles, even wealthy merchants, they would all resist any attempt to disrupt their established power structures. But Gilliman had no choice, with the Chaos God's ascendant and the Emperor still slumbering, a laissez-faire approach was untenable. Lawlessness ran rampant in many worlds, with brutal gangs preying on the populace, the rich exploiting the poor, and leaders abandoning their people in times of crisis. The average lifespan in some sectors dipped as low as 30 years, a grim testament to the dystopian reality gripping the Imperium. Gilliman's voice resonated with a quiet anger. Can you blame these people for turning to chaos? He questioned. They've reached rock's bottom. What's the alternative? Chaos may be corrupting, but how much worse can it truly be? He needed control, a system ensuring some semblance of equality and upward mobility. Only then could his rescued worlds become self-sufficient, providing a steady flow of talent and soldiers to bolster the failing Imperium. Zilla and the others exchanged uneasy glances. The Primarch's words were a radical departure from the established order. Was he considering a path akin to his brother Horus, one that led to rebellion? Noticing their trepidation, Gilliman continued, This is not a betrayal. Since my awakening, I've witnessed the rot at the heart of the Imperium. Ignorance and superstition have choked out the former glory and reason, leaving behind a decaying edifice. Tinkering with the old system might buy time, but it is a far cry from my further's vision. Necessary reforms will strengthen us, providing the tools we need to combat the threats of chaos and Dalian aggression. A note of sincerity crept into his voice. The choice is yours, he declared, addressing the governors and traders. Follow your convictions, I assure you no harm will come to you for your decision. However, one thing must be clear, the power of chaos is at its zenith, and the Great Rift has severed a significant portion of the Imperium from the Emperor's astronomic and beacon, leaving them vulnerable to alien and demonic incursions. He gestured towards them, his tone turning grim. You've witnessed the bloated bureaucracy of the Terror Council and the stagnation of the Mechanicus. Without change, the Emperor's dream will crumble in our hands. Humanity itself may face extinction. As the regent of the Imperium, Lord of Ultramar, and Primarch of the Ultramarines Legion, I implore you to become pillars of my endeavor. Gilliman's powerful words hung in the air, leaving the assembled leaders with a momentous decision to make. The fate of countless worlds, and perhaps humanity itself, rested on their answer. 13. Reform Gilliman's speech ended with a heavy silence. He observed the assembled leaders, their faces etched with contemplation. His words had laid the groundwork. The choice to join or oppose him was theirs. This reform was a seismic shift for the Imperium. It demanded loyalty and unwavering obedience to ensure his vision wouldn't be twisted or exploited by chaos. Undoubtedly, resistance would be fierce. The relinquishing of power was a bitter pill to swallow. Even on terror, before humanity reached for the stars, careerists waged brutal wars for control of mere millions of square kilometers. In the vast expanse of the Imperium, such ambition would only be amplified. Zilla, ever the pragmatist, made the first move. He rose and bowed. The House Hitler pledges its loyalty, esteemed regent. We swear allegiance here and now. Our loyalty to you will burn ever bright, like the sun of terror. With a leader emerging, a domino effect ensued. Planetary governors rose one by one, offering their salutes. House Valen stands with you. House Hitler pledges its service. One by one, they knelt robotic limbs and flesh alike touching the cold floor in a display of submission. Witnessing this, several rogue traders followed suit, their initial shock replaced by calculated pragmatism. The William Trade Consortium pledges to uphold your will. The Nancy Trade Consortium shall faithfully implement your decrees. But the room remained divided. Half the people had chosen submission, kneeling on the cold floor. The remaining half, their faces grim, exchanged troubled glances. Some even shifted their hands towards the holstered weapons at their waists, eyes scanning the room for any sign of blue-clad ultramarines emerging to unleash their power axes. This was serious business. Gilliman's words had crossed a significant line, implicitly challenging Terra's control over the Imperium. Such a move could be construed as a form of rebellion in Terra's eyes. A faint smile touched Gilliman's lips as he regarded the wary holdouts. Fear not. Your suspicions are astute. My primary concern lies in salvaging this dying empire, not embroiling myself in power struggles. Ten thousand years have seen the Imperium veer far from my further's vision. It falls upon me to correct its course with all haste. 
Those who have chosen not to kneel will be excused for now. I offer you time and space for myself and my loyal followers to discuss the upcoming reforms. Rest assured, I hold no malice for those who value their autonomy. There is no room for tyranny in my vision. With a gesture of courtesy, Gilliman dismissed those who remained unbowed. Only those who had knelt remained, ready to engage in the crucial discussions that would shape the future of the Imperium. Rise, everyone, he said, his voice warm. I commend your loyalty. Please, find a seat and let us begin. The sheer immensity of the human empire, spanning tens of thousands of light years, dwarfed any empire humanity could ever imagine. Coupled with inefficient navigation and communication technologies, reform became a daunting and delicate task. Gilliman envisioned a gradual rollout of reforms, spreading alongside the new technology entrusted to him by Corda. This subtle approach aimed to reshape the empire over a century or two. Every policy change would be meticulously crafted to minimize negative repercussions. For those officials who refused to submit, their positions wouldn't be immediately usurped. Instead, Gilliman planned a more subtle strategy. He likened it to boiling a frog, slowly stripping them of their power and influence, their value diminishing like a resource being steadily depleted. As the remaining leaders settled into their seats, Gilliman offered a warm smile to ease any lingering tension. I am truly grateful for your willingness to stay and assist me in this seemingly ambitious undertaking. Remember, everything we do is to ensure our species' continued existence in this cruel universe. We strive to preserve the empire my father built, to prevent it from crumbling into ashes under the relentless tide of chaos. A chorus of affirmations echoed through the chamber. We have no ill intentions, Regent. Your concerns are unfounded, Regent. We are here to support your vision. Regardless of any reservations, your leadership is invaluable. The state of many planets during my slumber was disheartening. The Empire abandoned them entirely, leaving them to flounder in ignorance and destitution. They were forced to offer the only things they possessed, their very lives, for a bare minimum existence. This blatantly disregards the equal value of every human life, a core principle my father cherished. This is not a betrayal, but rather a consequence of war and unchecked ambition. Some wallow in abundance, fresh food, pristine water, even personal gardens with hordes of servants, while others have to scavenge for scraps in toxic wastelands. Such disparity makes no sense. People will only fight for what they deem worth protecting. If they have nothing, if their lives are steeped in abject misery, what incentive do they have to reject the false promises of chaos? Gilliman harbored no reservations in expressing his anger towards the Empire's current state. Had anyone else voiced such sentiments, swift assassination or a traitor's brand would have been their fate. The state religion relentlessly preached obedience to the Imperium and unwavering faith in the Emperor. Gilliman's words, uttered by anyone else, would have ensured their disappearance by the next day. Zilla and the remaining leaders shifted uncomfortably in their seats. They couldn't help but wonder if a summary execution was on the agenda upon concluding the meeting. Fearing for their lives, the remaining leaders remained silent, their role reduced to attentive listeners. I will issue an official decree, Gilliman declared. A new wealth distribution system will be implemented first within Ultramar, expanding gradually across the Imperium. Additionally, I will allocate funds for the establishment of specialized educational institutions. Every world will enforce compulsory education, encouraging children to attend and embrace enlightened imperial ideals. Any organization tainted by chaos will be eradicated from the root. He elaborated on his reform plans one by one, ensuring those present documented everything. These ideas would form the bedrock of the coming reforms. Gilliman was well aware of the Imperium's fractured state. The Great Crusade, ten millennia ago, had allowed planetary administrators to maintain their existing systems as long as they promoted the imperial truth and paid taxes. This had resulted in a grotesquely uneven empire, with planets embracing everything from socialist systems to authoritarian regimes and even slavery. The Emperor's critical injuries and subsequent confinement to the Golden Throne, coupled with the Primarch's disappearance in the ensuing wars, had left the Terra High Lord's Council unwilling or unable to enact meaningful reforms. As long as planetary leaders met their tax obligations, their corrupt systems were allowed to persist. The Terra leadership, once a functional body, has become a stagnant entity. Meetings were a battleground for self-serving interests, progress agonizingly slow, bordering on insanity. The powerful families of Terra were laser-focused on securing positions for their own within Terra's governing bodies, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Administratum, to solidify their influence. Gilliman had no time for political games when facing the existential threat of chaos. He yearned for absolute control, fearing a treacherous stab in the back. 
After several hours of discussion culminating in a comprehensive reform plan, Gilliman dismissed the gathering. He authorized the remaining leaders to form a new parliament-like body with the purpose of self-governance and further refining the reform proposals. With the rogue traders and planetary governors gone, Gilliman rubbed his tired eyes. Sleep had been a luxury since his awakening. He had repelled the chaos forces, taken stock of the Empire's dire state, and now engaged in these lengthy meetings to appease different factions and make necessary arrangements. Exhaling deeply, he stretched his fingers. A soft electronic chime alerted him. It was Sicarius, captain of the second company of the Ultramarines, on the communicator. My lord, the captain's voice resonated, other battle groups, upon hearing news of your recovery, are eager for an audience. 14. Gathering of loyalists swift indeed, Gilliman acknowledged, straightening in his chair. They were already on their way to reinforce us. Your recovery must have prompted them to temporarily abandon their pursuit of chaos and divert to Macrag. Sicarius' deep voice filled the communicator. They expressed willingness to wait, but I felt it prudent to inform you. Gilliman sighed inwardly. There are many pressing matters at hand, but welcoming a loyal contingent from afar certainly qualifies as an immediate concern. Let them come. I shall await them in the reception hall. As you command, my lord. Silence descended upon the room again as the communicator deactivated. Gilliman, lost in thought, contemplated the future. Corda now possessed the new technology, and the Reform Council was established. The immediate tasks at hand were eradicating the chaos forces within Ultramar and gradually implementing their reform plans. Once the time was ripe, he would march on terror, wrest control of the Imperium from the corrupt and grasping High Lords, and push his agenda forward. The Great Rift's opening not only empowered the Chaos Gods but also offered the Emperor a chance at recovery. Before the Emperor awoke, Gilliman needed to bolster his own power to avoid a potential betrayal. He couldn't risk the Emperor tearing down the bridge he had built upon recovering. Ten thousand years of faith didn't guarantee that the Emperor, after millennia, remained unchanged. His return might not be a blessing in disguise. The broad hallways of the Hera fortress echoed with the footsteps of over fifty battle group representatives, led by two ultramarine warriors. The majestic corridor shimmered with gold and silver carvings, supported by imposing marble columns at regular intervals. Black and white checkered tiles formed a geometric tapestry across the floor. This is indeed a remarkable turn of events, whispered a chapter representative, clutching a scepter adorned with a golden skull and bone spurring. The crackling psychic energy emanating from him identified him as the chapter's librarian, a psycho warrior capable of prediction and elemental manipulation, and valuable assets in the fight against demons and other shinically endowed foes. Nothing is beyond the Emperor's design, a space marine clad in black and white armor countered. His scarred head bore two golden and one silver service nail, testaments to his century-long service. His chestplate displayed a prominent golden double-headed eagle, signifying his high rank. Enough of such talk, Vrano, leading the group, interjected, his gaze sweeping over his companions. We are on Macrag, on hallowed Ultramarine ground. Discussing a Primarch so casually is disrespectful. He feared such conversations might spark animosity between the battle groups. Silenced by Vrano's stern warning, the two warriors focused on their surroundings, their journey nearing its end. Cobalt banners adorned their hallways, their silver-threaded Ultramar logos forming a unique pattern surrounding a crowned Imperial legal. The path leading to the reception hall was lined with imposing ironclad terminators, their fierce armor evoking images of iron cavalry. These stoic guardians stood vigil, power weapons crackling with blue or green energy fields, a testament to the martial law enforced within the area. Vrono recognized these ironclad terminators from his past campaigns alongside Kanga. He remembered the grandeur of Imperial expeditions, with these honor guards flanking legendary figures. The first door hissed open with a pneumatic snap, revealing another set of honor guards, their expressions grim. These veterans bore the scars of innumerable battles against chaos, aliens, and traitors. An ultramarine captain approached, clad in the blue of his rank. Welcome to Macrag, he greeted. Sicarius, Vrono replied, raising a hand in salute. It's good to see you again. The sentiment is mutual, Vrono. Though reminiscing must wait. My lord awaits you. Please, enter. Sicarius gestured towards the final door. The honor guards stomped their feet in a solemn salute as Vrano and the others proceeded down the corridor. The intricately carved, golden eagle inlaid marble door of the main hall slid open with a mechanical hum. A tremor of nervousness rippled through the representatives. Removing their helmets, they steeled themselves and entered. The sight that greeted them was breathtaking. Upon a throne of solid gold, 
adorned with hundreds of ornate decorations, sat a living legend. A colossal warrior in blue and gold armor, with a broad, handsome face etched with seriousness, rested his hand upon a massive gauntlet. A colossal power sword lay sheathed beside his throne. Verino, despite believing himself prepared, found himself overwhelmed. Tears welled up in his eyes as he struggled to contain his emotions. He had seen this Primarch once before, during a Terranid incursion that threatened Macrag. His chapter had been called to assist, and it was then that he had met Gilliman in the sanctuary of Hera Fortress. Memories of the Primarch's entombed state flashed in his mind. This sight of Gilliman alive, radiating power and authority, was a transformative experience. The battle ten thousand years ago had left Gilliman a mere second from death. However, the stasis field's unique properties had infinitely stretched that fleeting moment. Now, freed from the stasis field, he sat before them, a living legend. Immense vitality radiated from Gilliman's powerful physique. His eyes held a profound wisdom and regal bearing. Vrano and the other space marines, as if guided by an instinct older than time, found themselves falling to one knee. They spoke the truth, Vrano said, his voice thick with a thrilling tremor. You are indeed resurrected, my lord. This wasn't fear, but a surge of electrifying excitement. Across the vast expanse of the Imperium, hearts would be pounding with the same exhilarating news. A living myth walked among them once more. Gilliman's gaze swept over them before he descended from the throne. Rise, all of you. You stand as humanities and the Imperium's defenders, heroes of the Empire. You deserve no such formality. He strode towards the nearest space marine, a resolute figure in black armor. Placing a hand upon each of the man's shoulders, Gilliman helped him to his feet. What is your name, brother? he inquired. Vrino, from the Raven Guard chapter, captain of the Silent Company. A pleasure, Captain Vrino, Gilliman replied. The honor is all mine, my lord. Let's hope so, Gilliman said with a hint of humor. I fear a refusal might cause me a significant headache. Vrino chuckled, his loyalty unwavering. There is no such possibility. We shall fight for your will. Gilliman patted Verino's shoulder. Excellent. Soon, you'll have ample opportunity to prove that. I trust you won't disappoint. He continued greeting the representatives in the front row, Raven Guard, Space Wolves, White Scars, and even chapters established after the formation of the Legions. All had come for the resurrected Primarch. He learned their names, endeavored to create a light-hearted atmosphere, and forged bonds through laughter. Every visitor received Gilliman's praise for their contributions to the Imperium. With the introductions concluded, Gilliman turned to the heart of the matter. You have traveled far, and ideally, I would have offered you respite. However, the Imperium faces dire straits. Chaos and aliens grant us no respite. I require immediate action to stabilize Ultramar before moving forward. Our fleet and army are gathering here on Macrag. I ask you, will you honor your oath and join my forces? Gilliman's gaze swept across the faces of the assembled battle group representatives his voice resonating with the weight of a critical decision. The fate of the Imperium hung in the balance. 15. Resolve and the scars of war Gilliman's smile broadened. Verino, your loyalty is unwavering, and I'm grateful for your unwavering support. He then turned his gaze to the other warriors, anticipation etched on their faces. The leader of the Salamanders stepped forward. His dark skin and stern expression contrasted with his verdant green power armor. The Salamanders have always been mankind's staunchest defenders, he stated. Those who stand against humanity's foes are our allies. I offer my chapter's service, unless you find us undesirable. Loyalty is a rare and treasured virtue, Gilliman responded. We have no room for pickiness. The Space Wolves representative, adorned with an imposing wolf head token, spoke next. The Space Wolves never shy away from a battle against Chaos and Xenos, Lord Regent. Our fangs will be the sharpest long swords in your hand. Gilliman chuckled. I eagerly await wielding that sharp sword to secure victory. One after another, the battle group representatives pledged their allegiance. They vowed to answer the regent's call, eradicate the chaos taint within Ultramar, and use it as a springboard to reclaim other sectors of the imperiled Imperium. With their loyalty confirmed, Gilliman dismissed them, urging them to rest and prepare for the coming campaign. A new war loomed, and humanity would once again raise its blades against the encroaching darkness. Bidding farewell to the final group, Gilliman pondered for a moment in the reception hall before exiting. His glory guard, clad in their imposing iron terminator armor, flanked him closely. Waiting outside were Calga, Sicarius, and Firks, the Ultramarines' finest warriors, heroes of the Imperium who had repelled countless assaults by chaos and Dalian hordes. 
Kalga saluted Gilliman. My lord. No need for formalities, Kalga, Gilliman replied with a wave of his hand. Join me on a tour of Macrag City. Let us observe the reconstruction efforts and discuss the future while we do. A converted hovercraft, originally intended for sightseeing, soon landed before them. Macrag, the Ultramarine's home world and capital of the 500 worlds, held a special significance. Tourists flocked to the planet every year to pay homage to the legendary chapter. Civilian hovercraft like this were once commonplace in Macrag, but the arrival of the Chaos forces have necessitated their militarization. This particular craft bore the telltale signs of such modification, thick steel plates welded onto the hull, traces of welding, and weapon mounts yet to be removed. Gilliman remained unfazed by the makeshift nature of the craft. His primary concern was the state of Macrag City. The war's scars were still raw and shocking. With the aid of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the survivors labored to rebuild their lives. Night Titans, stripped of their weaponry and equipped with construction tools, aided in the reconstruction, their immense power channeled into peaceful endeavors. Servitors with six mechanical legs scurried to and fro, delivering supplies to repair the war-torn buildings. Despite the devastation, a sense of resilience permeated Macrag. However, beneath the surface, whispers of discontent lingered. As Gilliman surveyed the city, a thunderous explosion suddenly shattered the relative quiet. Several Thunderhawk gunships roared overhead, streaking towards the source of the blast. They unleashed a devastating barrage, neutralizing the enemy threat before it could escalate. Verino's unwavering loyalty echoed in the hall, his words a testament to the unwavering dedication of the Raven Guard. Gilliman, heartened by the outpouring of support, turned his gaze to the other representatives, their faces alight with anticipation. The leader of the Salamanders, his dark features contrasting sharply with his verdant armor, stepped forward. The Salamanders have always championed humanity's defense, he declared. Those who fight the Imperium's enemies are our allies. I offer my chapter's service, unless you deem us unsuitable. Loyalty is a rare and valued treasure, Gilliman responded. There is no room for dismissiveness. Next came the Space Wolves' representative, his fierce demeanor accentuated by the imposing wolf head token adorning his armor. The Space Wolves never falter in the face of Chaos and Xenos, Lord Regent, he stated. Our fangs will be the sharpest long swords in your grasp. Gilliman's lips curved into a smile. I eagerly await wielding that sharp sword to secure victory. One by one, the representatives pledged their allegiance. They vowed to answer the Regent's call expunge the chaos taint from Ultramar, and use it as a launchpad to reclaim other beleaguered sectors of the Imperium. With their loyalty assured, Gilliman dismissed them, urging them to rest and prepare for the coming conflict. A new war loomed on the horizon, and humanity would once again face the encroaching darkness with steel in hand. After bidding farewell to the final group, Gilliman stood in the reception hall for a moment, lost in thought. Then, with the imposing glory guard clad in Iron Terminator armor flanking him, he strode out. Waiting outside were Kalga, Sicarius, and Ferx, the finest warriors of the Ultramarines, heroes of the Imperium who had thwarted countless assaults by Chaos and Dalian hordes. Kalga offered a sharp salute. My lord. Gilliman waved dismissively. No formalities, Kalga. Join me on a tour of Macrag City. Let us observe the reconstruction efforts and discuss the future while we do. A converted hovercraft, originally intended for sightseeing, soon touched down before them. Macrag, the Ultramarine's home world and capital of the 500 worlds, held immense significance. Every year, tourists flocked to the planet to pay homage to the legendary chapter. Civilian hovercrafts like this were once commonplace in Macrag, but the chaos invasion had necessitated their militarization. This particular craft bore the scars of such conversion, crudely welded steel plates reinforcing the hull, remnants of welding marks, and weapon mounts that hadn't yet been removed. Unfazed by the makeshift nature of the craft, Gilliman focused on the state of Macrag City. The war's scars were still fresh and brutal. With the aid of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the survivors toiled tirelessly to rebuild their lives. Night Titans, their fearsome weaponry replaced with construction tools, aided in the reconstruction, their immense power channeled into peaceful endeavors. Servitors with six mechanical legs scurried back and forth, delivering supplies to repair the war torn buildings. Despite the devastation, a spirit of resilience permeated Macrag. However, beneath the surface, whispers of discontent lingered. As Gilliman surveyed the city, a thunderous explosion shattered the relative calm. Several Thunderhawk gunships roared overhead, their forms streaking towards the source of the blast. 
they unleashed a devastating barrage, swiftly neutralizing the enemy threat before it could escalate. Gilliman, with his uncanny ability to read hearts, sensed Kalga's dejection. He elaborated, during this time, you can also assemble a suitable army. Once Ultramar is secure and Makrag is no longer under threat, this army will become the vanguard, spearheading the indomitable crusade. They'll pave the way for the follow-up forces, venturing across the Imperium to purge Chaos and Xenos. Kalga's eyes widened. My lord, are you saying I can build an army? Indeed, Kalga, Gilliman confirmed. A brand new army, with fresh recruits, new ships, and innovative tactics. This expedition isn't just about driving out chaos and eliminating enemies. It's about purging the Imperium's ills as well. He continued, outlining his vision. The reformers within the Parliament will accompany you. They will spread new Imperial ideals and systems throughout the Imperium, advocating for local reforms. Should obstinate conservatives resist, they can be dealt with as enemies. Gilliman's voice deepened. Kalga, this task cannot be entrusted to anyone else. You have earned my trust. Kalga's disappointment vanished, replaced by a surge of pride. I will strive to excel, my lord. Do not disappoint me, Kalga, Gilliman cautioned. You safeguard not only Macrag, but humanity's future. Any misstep would be a colossal betrayal of mankind. I understand, my lord. You will not be disappointed. The rest of the day was filled with audiences. Gilliman received visitors from various factions, listening to their concerns and formulating his decisions. A week later, a formidable force assembled under Gilliman's command. The Imperial Navy, Adeptus Mechanicus Skitrii, Sisters of Battle, Night Houses, Titan Legions, the Inquisition, and other contingents all contributed their might. The cleansing of Ultramar couldn't be delayed. Once this region was secured, they would move out across the vast expanse of space, purging the forces of chaos, quelling rebellions, and reshaping the human empire. Standing on the bridge of the Macrag's glory, a majestic Connor-class battleship, Gilliman addressed the entire assembled army via communication channels. His voice resonated through every vessel, reaching every soldier's ears. Brothers and sisters, my kin and blood. The chaos gods believed we humans would be their playthings, forever at their mercy. They ravaged our worlds and hunted our brethren, seeking to bend us to their dark will. But their dreams will perish. From this day forward, humanity fights back in full force against those accursed demons and xenos. We shall wield our sharp swords and declare, mankind shall never yield. Gilliman's voice rose, a thunderous roar that shook hearts. Humanity will never falter. Long live mankind. Long live the Emperor. His passionate declaration ignited the crew, soldiers, knights, space marines, inquisitors, and believers alike. They erupted in a deafening storm of cheers, responding with fanatic gestures. Humanity will never yield. Long live mankind. Long live the Emperor. The cacophony of cheers reached the surface of Macrag, where countless citizens echoed the same chant. Emotions surged, intertwining into a potent psychic wave that slammed against the raging warp storm near Macrag. The storm shuddered, a ripple of unease passing through the chaos gods themselves. Even far away, Celestin felt the tremors, her heart pounding with a newfound respect. With such a leader, how could the Imperium fail? Kalga stood on the planet's surface, gazing skyward. His people, fueled by the same fervor as his genetic father, roared their defiance. The power of this charismatic leader was undeniable. Set sail, Gilliman bellowed, his voice brimming with passion. Let us sound the death knell for the Imperium's enemies. This time, we fight for the Imperium, for mankind, and for the Holy Emperor. With another thunderous cheer, the warships ignited their engines and surged forward, tearing through the veil of reality and plunging into the warp. The fires of war were rekindled, and humanity, led by fearless heroes, refused to surrender to the encroaching darkness. They were prepared to face even the gods themselves, blades drawn in righteous fury. 16. A leader by example the cleansing of Ultramar was about to begin. Countless war engines roared to life amidst the rhythmic chants of the Adeptus Mechanicus priests their colossal forms leaving fiery trails as they launched from the starport and plunged into the starry abyss. One by one, battleships flickered to life as their gala fields activated, casting a faint ethereal glow around their massive hulls. This crucial technology safeguarded Imperial vessels from the corrupting influence of the warp, shielding them from the clutches of the demons lurking within. Gilliman's bold declaration of war had reverberated through the warp, drawing the unwelcome attention of the Chaos Gods. They deemed it an insolent act for a Primarch to defy them, and their response was swift and brutal. The warp churned with unimaginable fury, the celestial ocean erupting into a maelstrom of violence. Etheric tides surged and roared, 
a tempest of destruction lashing out at the Imperial fleet. Arrogance coalesced into churning whirlpools, rage and desire formed a tempestuous storm, and despair morphed into treacherous straits teeming with hungry warp entities. These demons hungered for any weakness to exploit, waiting to tear into the Imperial vessels. Deep within the heart of each ship, bound navigators lay submerged in nutrient solutions, their limbs and heads wired into the ship's intricate machinery. With their augmented third eyes, they strained to glimpse the currents of the warp, desperately seeking a safe passage for the fleet. Navigators were a breed apart, their lineage stretching back millennia. When humanity first ventured into the vast expanse of space, these individuals emerged, possessing a unique sensitivity to the warp's energy. Their guidance was instrumental in navigating the treacherous currents of the Immaterium. After specialized training and augmentation, they became the Empire's indispensable navigators. Each navigator possessed a third eye, either cybernetically implanted or a natural mutation. This unique organ allowed them to perceive the warp's energy flow, chart their course, and most importantly, detect the faint beacon of the Astronomicon. This celestial lighthouse, constructed by the Emperor during the Great Crusade and maintained by the Adeptus Astronomica, served as a vital navigation aid for Imperial vessels traversing the warp. The voyage was fraught with danger. Even Gilliman, despite his unwavering resolve, felt a tremor of apprehension as they braved the warp storm. The Astronomicon's light, once a guiding brilliance, had become a mere flicker, forcing the navigators to exert far greater effort to discern their path. The Imperial fleet could not sustain prolonged travel within the warp and was forced to make precarious jumps into rail space, seeking temporary refuge before venturing back into the swirling chaos. Thankfully, the tireless ministrations of the Adeptus Mechanicus ensured the Geller fields held strong, protecting the fleet from the warp's insidious influence. The absence of the Geller field spelled certain doom for any human vessel venturing into the warp. Exposed to its raw energies, they would be like defenseless prey to the ever-present demons. Gilliman's brow furrowed as he studied the data slate in his hand. The warp storm was far more turbulent than he had anticipated. Their options were limited, either find a way to quell the storm's fury or bolster the Imperial ship's resilience against its onslaught. Failure to achieve either would render their fight against the Chaos Gods a futile gesture. While demons and traitors reveled in the chaotic embrace of the warp, the human empire bore the brunt of its capricious nature. The sheer difficulty of navigating these treacherous currents placed humanity at a significant disadvantage. Gilliman's mind raced, searching for solutions. He needed resources, technology, anything that could enhance their navigation capabilities and guarantee their arrival at their destination. A series of footsteps broke the silence. A young man, cloaked in a long robe and bearing the unsettling mark of milky white A's, entered the chamber. Greetings, Lord Gilliman, the youth intoned his voice respectful despite his blindness. Gilliman acknowledged him, unfazed by the man's vacant A's. Such blindness was a common trait among astropaths, their sight replaced by a potent mental connection to the warp. Speak your mind, young one, Gilliman prompted, momentarily setting aside his contemplation. The warp storm presents a significant challenge, my lord, the astropath began. Our reliance on the warp for interstellar communication and travel is undeniable. The vast distances between star systems, measured in light years, render conventional communication methods obsolete. He continued, elaborating on the role of astropaths and the intricate web of communication that relied upon the warp. He explained the process of transforming information into psychic dreams, transmitted across the galaxy to other astropaths. These dreams, not mere words, conveyed complex thoughts and ideas. The receiving astropath then interpreted the dreams, deciphering the embedded information. To ensure the integrity of these messages and prevent demons from tampering, star language fortresses employed star language choirs. These choirs amplified the psychic transmissions, guaranteeing their successful reception across the vast expanse of the Imperium. All such fortresses and shipboard astropaths fell under the purview of Terra's astronomical court, which also replenished depleted astropath pools within these fortresses. The astropath concluded by explaining the soul-binding ritual, a crucial step in shaping an astropath's abilities. He described the perilous journey to Terra, where selected psychers were cleansed by the Emperor's power. This ritual safeguarded their sanity, preventing them from succumbing to the corrupting whispers of the warp. However, the sheer power of the Emperor's presence often resulted in blindness, a consequence of a mere mortal's inability to directly perceive the Emperor's essence within the warp. Kratz the blind astropath, recounted the distress message from the Sara galaxy. Chaos forces, specifically plague marines, were wreaking havoc on the local defenders. 
Gilliman's brow furrowed momentarily at the mention of the Plague Marines, but quickly regained its composure. Let the fleet continue its course towards Kona, he instructed. I will lead a smaller force to address this situation in Sara. Kratz, ever concerned for Gilliman's safety, voiced his reservations. My lord, with all due respect, wouldn't it be wiser to delegate this task to a company commander? There's no need for you to expose yourself to unnecessary risk. Gilliman offered a knowing smile. Nowhere is entirely safe, Roshan, he said, using Kratz's birth name. Danger is a prime arch's companion. The people of the Imperium need victories, even small ones, to bolster their spirits. A decisive blow against Chaos will serve as a beacon of hope, demonstrating that the tide is turning. Chaos is on the defensive, Roshan, desperate for victories to maintain control. They crave the reassurance that comes with conquest. Kratz persisted, his loyalty driving his concern. But my lord, you are irreplaceable. Should you fall, you will guide the Imperium. Gilliman's gaze held a steely resolve. I am no fragile relic, Roshan. I am a Primarch, forged for war and victory. My purpose is to lead the Imperium to triumph, not to languish on a pedestal. Our discussion ends here. Return to your post and keep me apprised of developments within the warp. I eagerly await your next report. Kratz bowed his head in acceptance. He knew a Primarch's word was law. He could offer counsel, but ultimately, the decision rested with Gilliman. The Primarch's authority was absolute. With a heavy heart, Kratz left, locating Sicarius at the door and informing him of the Primarch's request for an audience. Sicarius entered the chamber, ready to receive Gilliman's orders. The Primarch, a living legend, was about to embark on a mission, and Sicarius, ever the loyal warrior, was prepared to stand by his side. Together, they would face the foe and demonstrate to the Imperium the unwavering strength of their leadership. 17. The Emperor's angel Sicarius, Gilliman addressed the newly arrived captain, the movement of his armor emitting a satisfying metallic clang. He never strayed far from the suit that had facilitated his resurrection. It wasn't merely a creation of the Adeptus Mechanicus, but an artifact imbued with the power of the Death God itself. This essence mended the wounds of Gilliman's soul, allowing him to reclaim his life after millennia of slumber. In the fateful duel on Thessia, a treacherous blow from the Primarch Fulgrim had pierced Gilliman's neck, plunging him into a ten thousand year slumber. This wasn't just a physical injury, but a grievous assault on his very soul. Otherwise, even the removal of his heart wouldn't have resulted in immediate death. Similarly, the demise of Phorus Manus was not solely due to Fulgrim's attack, but because the weapon wielded by the traitor Primarch was infused with the corrupting power of chaos. To date, Gilliman remained tethered to this armor. Perhaps a solution would present itself upon unlocking the next level of his cheat database, as he mused internally. As Tropaths intercepted a distress call from the Sara galaxy, Gilliman explained. Plague marines are rampaging across the system, and the local defenders are requesting assistance. After analyzing the message, I've determined this galaxy lies on our current route. Therefore, I've made a decision. Prepare to detach the Macrag's glory and a contingent of the fleet to address this threat. Gather your fighters, Sicarius. Upon exiting the warp, we must be ready to deploy a swift and decisive force. Our speed is paramount. Following the pacification of the Sara galaxy, we'll rejoin the main fleet and proceed to the industrial world of Kona. Sicarius hesitated, then spoke cautiously. My lord, your presence is not required on the battlefield. Captain Fakris is more than capable of handling this situation. We cannot risk your safety. No, Sicarius, Gilliman countered, his voice firm. I cannot decree a course of action and then hide behind others while they fight. The fleets will inevitably be dispersed, responding to calls for help across numerous galaxies. As Primarch, the Imperium needs me to deliver victories. The populace requires a tangible symbol of hope. My decision is final. Prepare for our deployment, Sicarius. Gilliman's tone brooked no further argument. His objectives extended beyond appeasing the Imperial citizenry. The master of mankind's power could be amplified by the collective faith of the Imperium. The greater his popularity, the more awe-inspiring his record, the more unwavering the trust of the people. It functioned like a cumulative bonus system, akin to a never-ending source of power. Just like a butcher's cleaver against a brick, or a Buddha statue against another Buddha statue, the stronger the belief, the greater the power unleashed. Gilliman's enemy was clear, the chaos gods. His purpose was resolute, he lived, so evil died. His demise meant the reign of the malevolent deities. This conflict was locked in an eternal struggle, an unyielding clash of ideologies. Only one side could prevail, marking the definitive end of this war.
Gilliman understood the necessity of bolstering his prestige. The unwavering belief of the imperial populace in him as the rightful heir, the Lord of Ultramar, the beacon of salvation, was a crucial asset. Sicarius, recognizing the unyielding resolve in his primarch's voice, could only offer his acquiescence. He bowed his head in deference, then turned and strode out. A whirlwind of activity followed. Fighters on the Macrag's glory were readied for combat, the entire vessel humming with anticipation as they prepared to swiftly purge the Sara galaxy of its infestation. Gilliman, at the helm of a detached fleet, would spearhead the liberation effort. The rest of the Armada, under the command of various heroes, would tackle other galaxies beset by the forces of chaos. Though their combined might was undeniably formidable, achieving swift victory and restoring stability to Ultramar was an ambitious goal. The sheer vastness of the Imperium necessitated the division of their forces. Celestin, Amriki, and other champions of the Imperium led their respective fleets to galaxies drowning in the tides of chaos. Their ultimate destination, however, was Kona, the industrial world situated on the outermost edge of Ultramar, bordering the Imperium's very fringes. These heroes would converge on Kona via different routes, aiding beleaguered star systems along the way. Once all fleets assembled in Kona, the true offensive against the forces of chaos within Ultramar would commence, setting the stage for a push that would ripple outwards to other Imperial starfields. Saint Celestin, Inquisitor Grey, and others harbored anxieties about Gilliman venturing onto the battlefield personally, haunted by the spectre of his ten thousand year slumber. However, their pleas fell on deaf ears, Gilliman's resolve was unwavering, and each hero, accepting his decision, took charge of their assigned fleets, embarking on missions to liberate countless suffering worlds. Aboard the bridge of the Macrag's glory, a symphony of activity unfolded. Servitors, their bodies wired into the ship's control center, trembled as information pulsed through their neural interfaces. Their digitized voices broadcasted updates in a monotonous cadence. Coordinate data detected, Sara Galaxy. The captain, his robotic arm a testament to past battles, scanned the data streams with his cybernetic eyes before barking out the order, enter real space. Data flowed like a torrent, processed and disseminated by the data director, power director, and intelligence director each working at the peak of their mechanical capabilities to maintain seamless control over the colossal vessel. Entity universe coordinate data passed. Energy circuits converting, establishing gateway to real space. Propulsion system stable. Amidst a flurry of rapid announcements, the Macrag's glory, a majestic titan stretching over 26 kilometers, ripped its way out of the warp. Following in its wake were warships from other chapters, their crews ready to fight alongside Gilliman in the coming conflict. A deluge of information flooded the bridge, a constant stream of data being exchanged between vessels, a testament to the coordinated might of the Imperial fleet. A harsh cacophony erupted on the bridge. The avian augury screeched its warnings, its mechanical counterpart, the cogitator, mimicking the screech with a rapid clicking. In unison, the announcers wired into the divination instruments blared the dreaded news, chaos ship detected, chaos ship detected. Their twitching bodies and amplified voices painted a grim picture. Shift Geller field to void shield, full battle readiness, open fire at will. Purge these damned traitors, let them feel the Emperor's righteous fury. The captain, his grip tightening on the railing, roared his orders, his voice echoing across the bridge. The battle raged on Sarah, its once proud hive city, Grix, now a monument to devastation. The relentless onslaught of plague marines had ravaged the metropolis. Survivors huddled within the star language fortress the lone bastion shielded by a functional void shield. This shield stood as their last line of defense, their only hope against the tide of corruption. Boom after thunderous boom echoed across the ruined cityscape as the defenders, clinging to their dwindling hope, unleashed their meager firepower against the encroaching horde. Their positions grumbled bit by bit, overrun by the shambling masses of plague marines. These walking corpses, victims of chaos vile mutations, were testaments to the horror unleashed upon this world. They devoured anything living, adding their victims to their grotesque ranks. Within the cramped confines of the fortress, civilians huddled together, their faces etched with despair. They sought solace in the warmth of each other's bodies, a desperate attempt to ward off the chilling grip of fear. Every man and woman capable of bearing arms had been thrown into the fray, their valiant efforts ending in their transformation into the very enemy they fought, another cog in the Plague Marine's macabre machinery. An elderly woman held two children close, their wide eyes reflecting a terror beyond comprehension. Innocence had been shattered, replaced by a profound understanding of mortality. Born into an era of darkness, they knew only suffering. 
Their once peaceful existence had been shattered just a few months prior. Nightmares of watching their further march off to war, witnessing their mother's gruesome demise at the hands of the plague marines, haunted their young minds. A small voice, trembling with fear, broke the silence. Grandma, the girl whimpered, her gaze shifting between the fervent prayers of the kneeling figures and the woman's weathered face. You always said the emperor protects us. Why hasn't he sent his angel? He didn't save mom and dad either. The old woman fought back tears, forcing a reassuring smile. Her bony arms strained as she held the children tighter. Grandma doesn't know, little one. She rasped, her voice betraying a flicker of doubt. Perhaps the emperor's angels are busy elsewhere. Even in the abyss of despair, a faint glimmer of hope flickered on the horizon. Unaware of the devastation unfolding below, the Macrag's glory, a beacon of salvation, emerged from the warp, carrying with it the wrath of the Emperor and the unwavering resolve of Gilliman. 18. Clash amongst the stars Gilliman, clad in his majestic Azure power armor, strode onto the command deck. He was flanked by his honor guard, their iron cavalry terminator armor transforming them into hulking figures of steel. The sheer immensity of their presence filled the room with an oppressive weight, leaving the bridge crew struggling to catch their breath. The Glory Guard, veterans of countless battles and adorned in the most formidable Terminator armor the Ultramarines possessed, exuded an aura that demanded respect. Standing under their gaze, ordinary crewmen felt a tremor of fear course through them. Report. Captain Bre, Gilliman addressed the officer occupying the command chair. What is the current situation? Enemy forces have converged on planet number two within the Sara galaxy, Bre responded, his voice strained under the scrutiny of the Primarch. Based on their insignia and battleship characteristics, our intel appears accurate. The enemy is indeed the Death Guard. A wave of grim recognition washed over Gilliman. The Death Guard, plague spreaders, cursed betrayers, the Empire's eternal enemies, unforgiven traitors. They were once the 14th Legion, a force instrumental in the Great Crusade and the unification of mankind under the Emperor's banner, led by the Primarch Mortarion, their contributions were undeniable. However, the tides of loyalty had shifted during the Horus heresy. Mortarion, in a pivotal act of betrayal, turned his legions against the loyalists in the Atari galaxy, joining the rebellion alongside other traitor legions and unleashing a bloody massacre. Their treachery deepened during a warp transit. Aboard their flagship, Mortarion fell prey to the machinations of a young psyker named Typhon, who deliberately sabotaged the vessel's Jella field, plunging the fleet into the perilous depths of the warp. Left stranded and vulnerable, they became easy prey for the corrupting whispers of chaos. Mortarion, a primarch renowned for his staunch resistance to witchcraft and a loathing for all things chaotic, found himself an unlikely target. Through a torturous ordeal, Nurgle, the chaos god of plague, death, and stagnation, twisted and warped him to his will. Mortarion, once an unwavering defender of the Imperium, became a puppet of the very forces he once despised. He was a cautionary tale. A testament to the insidious nature of chaos, capable of seducing even the most resolute souls. Nurgle's tainted influence transformed Mortarion into a demon primarch, a living embodiment of decay. He led the Death Guard, now corrupted beyond redemption, in the Battle of Terror, unleashing a plague upon the Imperial Palace that claimed countless lives. Following the rebellion's defeat, the remnants of the Death Guard scattered, fleeing to the Eye of Terror, the festering heart of chaos, and the fringes of the Imperium. They remained a constant threat, a thorn in the side of the Emperor's dominion. Gilliman digested the report on the Death Guard, his brow furrowed in contemplation. He turned back to Captain Bre, his voice resolute. Victory is unquestionable, he declared. However, the situation on the planet's surface concerns me. Has there been any response to our communications attempts? Bre's face mirrored the weight of the grim news. No, my lord. All transmissions, electromagnetic and astrological alike, have been intercepted. It's highly likely the enemy controls all communication channels. Worse still, the astropaths stationed there are either corrupted or dead. Anger flickered in Bre's remaining eye. Another planetary massacre, another toll of billions sacrificed to the insatiable hunger of the Chaos Gods. He silently prayed for the souls of the unfortunate civilians, hoping the Emperor would grant them his mercy. Perhaps this is a turning point, Gilliman mused his gaze drifting towards the tactical console. The wiring machinery hummed a constant melody as the Adeptus Mechanicus instruments whirred to life. A holographic display flickered into existence, depicting the strategic layout of the Sara galaxy and the enemy's fleet composition. All plague ships were concentrated in orbit around the second planet. Indeed, Brer agreed, a flicker of hope sparking in his eyes. 
We attack, Gilliman declared with unwavering determination. Eradication is paramount. If any survivors remain, we offer them salvation. If not, we avenge their sacrifice. As you command, my lord, Bre acknowledged, a solemn oath hanging heavy in the air. The Macrag's glory, leading the Imperial fleet, surged forward, the planet Sarah II filling their view. A verdant world, capped my polarized sheets, unfolded before them. Lush green plains and sprawling forests dominated the landscape, punctuated by scattered desert regions. It was a picture of idyllic beauty, a haven for humankind with exceptional colonization potential. Six sprawling hive cities dotted the surface, one particularly gargantuan structure covering a staggering 26 million square kilometers. Data projections estimated a population exceeding 50 billion, a vital asset to the Warthorn Imperium. The arrival of the Imperial fleet did not go unnoticed. The plague fleet stirred, their vessels launching a counteroffensive as they sought to intercept the Imperial ships. Gilliman observed the unfolding battle on the tactical display. The enemy fleet comprised three separate groups, lacking any semblance of coordinated strategy. Gilliman's keen eyes recognized the inherent weakness of the Chaos forces, their mutual distrust. Unlike the disciplined ranks of the Imperial Navy, these warbands preferred independent operations. Lacking the ability or will to fight under a unified command, as the distance between the fleets dwindled to a mere three million kilometers, a brutal close-quarters engagement erupted. The Imperial vessels unleashed a devastating salvo. Torpedoes and missiles fanned out in a wide formation, forming a staggered barrage. Simultaneously, tons of anti-ship artillery shells rained down, aiming to restrict the enemy's maneuverability. Space combat, however, was a dance of constant flux. Engagement distances could shift dramatically, stretching to millions of kilometers at a moment's notice. This made targeting with torpedoes, missiles, and artillery shells a challenging prospect, as enemy ships constantly adjusted their positions. Coordinating such a chaotic battlefield demanded immense processing power. Gilliman, ever vigilant, monitored every change, his gaze sweeping across the tactical display. He had previously envisioned a future where energy weapons like lances would take center stage, rendering torpedoes and missiles obsolete. Witnessing the unfolding battle, however, shattered that notion. Each weapon possessed its own strengths. Missiles boasted automatic tracking capabilities, allowing them to strike any point on the enemy vessel. Lance weapons, while undeniably fast, lacked maneuverability, firing in a straight line with destructive power easily countered by shields. Physical projectiles, like torpedoes and shells, offered undeniable advantages in their raw power. Their previously lamented slow speed could even be a tactical advantage, forcing the enemy to hold their positions for fear of direct impacts. Likewise, stationary torpedoes and mines, though slow, held the potential to bypass void shields entirely, wreaking catastrophic damage upon detonation. The distance between the fleets, while vast on an ordinary scale, constituted close quarters within the context of space warfare. Lance beams and colossal shells zipped through the void, transforming the space between them into a deadly ballet of light and metal. The Macrag's glorious void shield flared repeatedly under the onslaught of energy weapons, its surface rippling and undulating. The strain of dissipating energy caused the shield generators to whine under the pressure, some even spitting out alarming sparks. The Plague Marines, with an uncanny awareness, zeroed in on the Macrag's glory, recognizing it as the linchpin of the Imperial fleet. Yet, despite their characteristic disorganization, they launched a coordinated assault. The Imperial flagship, unfazed by the concentrated fire, met it head-on, unleashing a devastating counter-barrage of its own. Artillery shells, with the firepower to level entire cities, rained down upon the enemy ranks. A plague ship, its void shields overwhelmed, found itself a victim of a torpedo strike. The torpedo slammed into the vessel's prow, sending it into a sickening spin as it became a target for a relentless volley of attacks. Torpedoes, missiles, and lance beams tore through its hull followed by the catastrophic detonation of its plasma energy core. The vessel erupted in a silent explosion, engulfed in flames that slowly consumed it, transforming it into a blazing pyre adrift in the void. The debris from the exploding battleship included a hunk of metal resembling a mansion. This unintended projectile slammed into another plague ship, overloading its void shield. The hapless vessel was then ripped apart by a relentless hail of macro-cannon fire from an Imperial cruiser. The Macrag's glory, the linchpin of the Imperial fleet, acted as a monstrous blade, carving a bloody swathe through the enemy's heart. The tide of the battle was swiftly turning. The Imperial forces, emboldened by their early successes, pressed their advantage with relentless fervor. 
victory, it seemed, was within their grasp. This behavior is aberrant, Ficarus muttered, shaking his head in bewilderment as he observed the unfolding scene. Logically, they would have initiated a retreat upon realizing defeat. Perhaps they've been craven with fear, Bres sneered, a hint of dark amusement coloring his voice. His greatest pleasure lay in personally overseeing the destruction of enemy vessels, their wreckage destined to become macabre ice sculptures in the cold embrace of space. A dead traitor, he declared with grim satisfaction, is a traitor duly recognized. Gilliman, however, remained unconvinced. He averted his gaze from the tactical display, a frown etching itself onto his face. There's more to this, he declared, his voice heavy with unease. Focus your efforts on retrieving intel from the surface of Sarah too. The key to understanding this anomaly might lie there. Despite being a time traveler, he had inherited the memories and power of his predecessor, essentially undergoing a form of fusion. The tactical prowess and wisdom gleaned from this inheritance left him feeling suspicious of the Plague Marines' uncharacteristic bravery. Their behavior reeked of desperation, more akin to Korn's blind rage than the methodical approach favored by Nurgle, the Plague God. Nurgle championed decay and entropy, not mindless slaughter. 19. The tide crashed despite the Plague Fleet's newfound resolve to fight to the bitter end, their inevitable demise loomed large. Morale soared within the Imperial Fleet, bolstered by the presence of a Primarch. Every Imperial commander strived for flawless execution, each action a potential opportunity to earn the Primarch's recognition. Their numerical advantage, coupled with the disjointed efforts of the Chaos Forces, promised a swift victory. Gilliman's gaze narrowed as he studied the holographic image of the Plague Fleet. A colossal battleship, encrusted with filth and pulsating with a sickening life, dominated the scene. Malicious eyes seemed to pierce through the image, radiating a malevolent aura. The corruption of the warp was writ large upon this vessel. Maintain course, Gilliman commanded, his voice echoing across the bridge. Focus fire on their flagships, victory shall be ours. He pointed toward the monstrous vessel. That monstrosity is their heart, cripple it, and their resistance will crumble. A flurry of activity erupted on the bridge. Technicians, supervisors, and mechanical priests scrambled to execute the Primarch's orders. Below decks, the frenetic pace intensified. Junior officers barked orders at Grumman, the occasional crack of a whip or a swift kick serving as motivators. The rhythmic boom of a loading bays echoed throughout the vessel as shells were hoisted by elevators and fed into the hungry maw of the Macrag's glory's macro cannons. Deep within the bowels of the ship, a mechanical priest chanted binary hymns, his words a desperate plea to the machine god, ensuring the smooth operation of the sacred vessel. In response to Gilliman's command, the entire Imperial fleet accelerated, launching a final, decisive attack. The Primarch, however, remained fixated on the enemy flagship, his keen eyes searching for a chink in the Void Shield's defenses. These battleships, behemoths stretching over 10 to 20 kilometers, were capable of reducing unprotected worlds to cinders. Their immense size allowed for not only greater cargo capacity but also thicker and more resilient void shields. The core sections, shielded by layers of void shield technology and several meters of reinforced hull, could withstand sustained bombardment for hours. Gilliman bristled with impatience. These paltry foes dared to delay him for so long? How could he hope to deliver a crushing blow to Chaos and Greenskins alike if such setbacks persisted? The bird divination instrument word to life, data streams flooding Gilliman's augmented senses. He processed information with inhuman speed, exceeding even the blink of an eye. Within seconds, he sifted through the deluge, his prodigious intellect discerning the enemy's weakness. A flicker. An instability in the enemy flagship's void shield. The pulse regulator within the shield generator was faltering. Target the flagship, Gilliman declared with unwavering conviction. His fingers danced across the data pad, activating a holographic projection. The flagship's image materialized, pulsating with highlighted weak points, the enemy's vulnerabilities laid bare by the power of the machine spirit. The cogitator translated the information into a tactical display, pinpointing these critical areas on the holographic projection. A series of confirmations zipped through the communication channels via Datalink, each ship acknowledging the designated targets. Fleet locked, a voice confirmed. Then unleash hell, Gilliman commanded, his voice resonating with finality. The Imperial fleet tightened its formation, a deadly net closing in on the unsuspecting chaos vessels. A torrential barrage of fire erupted, overwhelming the enemy in a storm of shells and energy lances. The chaos flagship, specifically targeted, shuddered under the relentless onslaught. 
its void shield flickered desperately, on the verge of collapse. A torrent of torpedoes and lances found their mark, striking the exposed hull with devastating precision. The combined fury of countless nuclear detonations, macro shells, torpedoes, and lances overwhelmed the vessel's defenses. Thirty agonizing seconds passed before the inevitable. A colossal pillar of fire erupted from the heart of the ship, its spine buckling under the sustained punishment. A blinding detonation followed, a miniature sun engulfing the Chaos flagship in a sphere of searing yellow light. Gilliman, momentarily blinded by the brilliance, felt the observation deck dim as automated safety protocols adjusted the viewport filters, shielding the bridge crew from the harsh afterglow. The flagship was no more. The remaining Chaos vessels, bereft of their leadership and overwhelmed by the Imperial onslaught, were quickly dispatched. Gilliman, ever decisive, directed Brer to mop up the remaining enemy forces. A sudden intrusion interrupted the moment of victory. Donners, the Dawn Star Chapter's librarian clad in his power armor, approached the Primarch with a grim report. My lord, he began, his voice laced with urgency, we've detected anomalous fluctuations on the surface of Saratu. The barrier between reality and the warp is weakening. The Plague Marines are attempting to summon their allies. Gilliman's brow furrowed. The implications were dire. He understood the horrors the traitors might unleash, vile rituals beyond human comprehension. The summoning of demons from the warp, fueled by blood, pain, and the sacrifice of innocent souls, would unleash a torrent of destruction upon this world. The very fabric of reality shuddered under the strain of their unholy endeavor. We must act with haste, Gilliman declared, the weight of responsibility settling upon his shoulders. The mere thought of the atrocities the traitors might commit sent a shiver down his spine. These demons, once summoned, would wreak havoc upon the unsuspecting populace. The consequences were too horrifying to contemplate. Prepare for immediate surface deployment, he instructed. We descend to eradicate this filth. Let the demons of the warp know the wrath of the Imperium. They will learn to regret setting foot upon this world. Scene shift, Sarah Star, Glick's hive outskirts. Gurlo, his bloated form straining against the confines of his ancient Terminator armor, gazed with disdain upon the shimmering void shield protecting the last human stronghold, Glick's hive city. Disgust contorted his features. These humans, he thought, were little more than brainwashed puppets of the corpse emperor, their minds blinded to the generous gifts offered by their loving father, Nurgle. Gurlo lumbered towards the ruined outskirts of Glick's his corrupted power armor groaning under the weight of his immense form. The once proud suit of armor, a relic of the Horus heresy crafted by the Dark Mechanicum, was a testament to bygone power, now corrupted and reeking of decay. Yet, in Gurlo's twisted perspective, Nurgle's blessing had only enhanced its resilience. They do not understand the true meaning of fraternity, he rasped, addressing the other plague marines flanking him, their form similarly grotesque parodies of humanity. Their minds are narrow and selfish. Nurgle's generosity is boundless, his love freely offered to all. But these ingrates cling to their false emperor, refusing the true power of the dark gods. A sneer twisted Gurlo's face. We offered them a gift, a path to salvation, and they rejected it. Now they shall face the consequences. The son of the corpse emperor has arrived, but it's too late. We shall unleash the final assault, crush their pathetic resistance, and complete the ritual. This world shall become a paradise, a garden nurtured by the loving embrace of Nurgle. 20. A desperate stand let the blessings of the father flow, boomed Gurlo, striding forward with a swagger. The other plague marines respectfully parted for their corpulent leader. Their armor, a grotesque parody of one's noble war gear, oozed with putrid liquids, stretched taut by their bloated forms. A buzzing cloud of green flies hovered malevolently around them, their fetid bodies exuding a noxious green mist. We offer these fools a gift, the embrace of our loving father, echoed Gurlo's lieutenant, his voice a rasping wheeze emanating from a throat choked by decay. He trailed close behind Gurlo, a fleshy power maul clutched tightly in his hand. Vials filled with bubbling concoctions and experimental blade grenades hung ominously from his belt. A chilling truth hung heavy in the air. This plague marine, an alchemist of pestilence, wielded a power far more insidious than raw violence. His concoctions, the horrific cocktail of virulent plagues, could poison entire imperial worlds, spreading suffering across galaxies. He could turn loyal citizens into mindless puppets, pawns in Urgle's twisted game. The threat he posed transcended the immediate battlefield, it was a creeping terror capable of infecting entire populations. For the father, roared a plague marine, brandishing a rusty bolter. Gift, gift, echoed another, his voice dripping with a perverse piety. Death to the corpse emperor. 
the chorus swelled, a cacophony of hate and madness. A tide of plague marines surged forward, a grotesque amalgamation of warriors wielding rusted bolters, serrated swords, and plague guns that spewed forth clouds of noxious miasma. Their battle cries, laced with fanaticism, drowned out the roar of artillery fire. Demon engines lumbered into action, their mechanical groans a counterpoint to the guttural chants of the plague marines. Gurlo, his bulk a mountain of festering flesh, raised his colossal plague cleaver, a primal bellow escaping his diseased lungs. We are the sons of Mortarion. We are plague and death incarnate. The plague marines roared in unison, their voices a monstrous symphony of hate. Artillery shells rained down upon the shimmering void shield protecting the fortress, each detonation blossoming into a malevolent bloom of green flame. The shield strained under the relentless onslaught, the once proud barrier flickering precariously. Every bombardment chipped away at the shield generator's reserves, pushing it closer to the brink of overload. Without the shield's protection, the fortress would become a helpless prey, ripe for the taking. Unleash the further's gifts, Gurlo bellowed, his voice hoarse with exertion. From the rear of the plague marine ranks, a shambling horde lurched forward. These were not warriors, but wretched parodies of humanity, former defenders and innocent civilians twisted by an Urgle's touch into mindless walking corpses. Clad in the tattered remnants of their imperial uniforms, these puppets served a single purpose, the transmission of disease. These mindless creatures, their eyes vacant and glazed, lurched forward in a shambling mass. A vile stench of putrefaction emanated from their rotting forms, a symphony of decay punctuated by the chilling moans of the restless dead. Driven like cattle by the plague marines, they served as a living shield, a grotesque wave of expendable pawns meant to overwhelm the imperial defenses. Tens of thousands of these walking corpses flooded the ruined landscape, their shambling forms a sickening tide surging towards the imperial bastion. The plague marines herded them onward, wielding their weapons not against the enemy, but to ensure their mindless charges stayed on course. Behind them, the relentless bombardment continued, plague weaponry and demonic engines unleashing a torrent of destruction. The void shield, already flickering precariously, strained under the relentless onslaught, its protective barrier teetering on the verge of collapse. As the enemy horde reached the optimal firing range, the defenders unleashed their fury. Heavy laser cannons and plasma cannons roared to life, tearing through the ranks of plague-ridden mutants. Artillery rained down upon the shambling masses, exploding them into gory showers of flesh and bone. Flames roared from massive flamethrowers, incinerating the grotesque plague flies that dared to approach the defense lines. Laser beams sliced through the ranks, vaporizing the walking corpses and leaving smoldering husks in their wake. Despite the overwhelming odds, the defenders roared their defiance, the Emperor's battle cry echoing across the battlefield. They fought with a desperate tenacity conserving ammunition but unleashing a fury fueled by unwavering faith. Their aim was precise, every shot meant to cripple or kill. The plague warriors responded in kind. Their bolt guns barked with deadly precision, targeting the defenders' heavy weapons and command centers. Explosive rounds detonated within the fortress, scattering limbs and turning fortified positions into smoking craters. The demonic engines, hulking machines fueled by the warp's corrupt energies, belched forth plagues and toxins, choking the defenders and further weakening their resolve. The Imperial forces were driven back, inch by bloody inch. Despite their valiant efforts, their heavy weaponry had been largely neutralized throughout previous battles, leaving them woefully outmatched against the firepower wielded by the Chaos forces. They resorted to desperate tactics, strapping melter bombs to their bodies and charging into the fray, seeking to take down the enemy giants with suicidal devotion. Emperor protect us, murmured Gion, his voice thick with despair as he peered through his binoculars. He watched in horror as the terrifying dreadnought like meshs, warped and corrupted reflections of the Imperium Zone technology, emerged from the sickly green mist, herding the plague-ridden horde before them. He knew, with a chilling certainty, that unless a miracle intervened, the fortress would crumble under the relentless assault. The plague marines fielded their own dreadnoughts as well, ancient war machines dating back 10,000 years, their potent weaponry enhanced by the dark blessings of chaos. They towered over the imperial dreadnoughts, their every movement radiating raw, destructive power. The dreadnoughts lumbered past the burning husk of a chimera APC, their immense size dwarfing the armored personnel carrier. The fearless, a hulking war machine of chaos, wielded a massive cannon in one hand, unleashing a torrent of destructive energy. Its other appendage, a barbed claw, held the remains of a slain plague marine, deposited within a gaping maw studded with pulsating eyes. Jian, 
his heart heavy with dread, had witnessed the fearless devastating power on numerous occasions. These monstrous machines chewed through the imperial defenses with sickening ease. He recalled with a shudder their brutal dismantling of a bane blade, a super-heavy tank, its once imposing form reduced to smoldering scrap metal. Driven by a desperate urge to make a difference, Jian considered a suicidal charge. Perhaps, he thought, with a melter bomb strapped to his chest, he could cripple one of these behemoths. He envisioned the coordinated assault, a team of soldiers sacrificing themselves to take down the enemy giants. But hope was quickly extinguished. A squad of brave souls launched their desperate attack, only to be vaporized by the fearless long-range weaponry. A wry smile touched Jian's lips, a bitter acceptance of his fate. He had lived a decent life, over thirty years of loyal service to the Imperium. A wave of despair washed over him as he turned his gaze towards the fortress interior. His enhanced vision, courtesy of his prosthetic eyes, revealed the terrified faces of civilians huddled within. He knew, with chilling certainty, the horrors that awaited them if the fortress fell. Chaos knew no mercy. Jian straightened his back, a flicker of defiance replacing the despair. The flickering shield seemed on the verge of collapse, the sky above choked by the sickly green haze of the plague. They had fought valiantly, but the outcome was tragically predetermined. Through the Vox Channel, his voice resonated with a quiet dignity, it's been an honor, comrades. May the Emperor embrace our souls. The glory of mankind will endure, the Emperor's light will shine eternal. We fight to our last breath, for chaos shall never break our spirit. His words hung in the air as the overwhelmed void shield flickered its last. A barrage of plague bombs rained down on the fortress, detonating in a geyser of flame and toxic clouds. Screams, both of defiance and terror, echoed from within the besieged structure. The desperate pleas of civilians pierced the air. The defenders, knowing the end was nigh, fought with renewed fury. Hand-to-hand -hand combat erupted, a desperate struggle against the tide of chaos. Plague walkers and plague marines surged forward, reaping a bloody harvest amongst the imperial ranks. Undeterred, the defenders fought with the courage of cornered animals, determined to hold the line for as long as possible. The fate of Glick's hive hung in the balance. Twenty-one. Might a hundred space marines, their forms clad in gleaming power armor, stood poised on the glorious Macrag's drop deck. The rhythmic hum of the ship's engines provided a constant backdrop as they awaited the imminent deployment order. The battle raging outside the viewport offered a stark contrast to the controlled chaos within. Streaks of brilliant light. The telltale signs of ship-to-ship -ship combat punctuated the vast expanse of space. Wrecks of plague ships, their once proud hulls reduced to smoldering husks, drifted silently in the void, a grim testament to the Imperial fleet's dominance. The destruction of the enemy flagship had dealt a crippling blow to the Chaos forces, leaving their remaining vessels vulnerable and scattered. The glorious Macrag, however, had foregone the opportunity to further press the advantage in the void. Gilliman, the Primarch and commander of the Imperial forces, had his gaze fixed firmly on the planet below. The potential for a horrific demonic ritual unfolding on the surface far outweighed the fleeting glory of additional fleet victories. This particular force of a hundred space marines represented a unique spearhead, a potent blend of warriors from two distinct chapters. Gilliman, ever the strategist, was actively promoting a new approach to warfare. He envisioned space marine chapters no longer operating as lone wolves, but as a cohesive unit capable of both independent guerrilla actions and large-scale, coordinated operations reminiscent of the Great Crusade. This strategy promised a terrifying prospect for the Imperium's enemies, the ability to deploy tens of thousands of perfectly coordinated space marines in a single, planet-shattering assault. Among the assembled warriors, fifty bore the iconic blue armor of the Ultramarines chapter, their veterans adorned in the formidable Terminator armor. Alongside them stood their brethren from the Aurora Stars, a successor chapter of the Ultramarines. Their armor, a distinctive shade of grey accented with blue, displayed the chapter's proud heritage. While perhaps less opulent than the Ultramarines, the Aurora Stars still fielded a respectable force, with a handful of veterans clad in Terminator armor and the remainder equipped with standard power armor. On the deck below, a flurry of activity unfolded. Tech priests and servitors scurried about, meticulously prepping the space marines for their descent. The veterans, encased in their bulky Terminator armor, underwent rigorous self-inspections with the aid of the tech priests, ensuring their war machines were in peak condition. Their comrades, clad in standard power armor, were equipped with hefty assault shields by servitors, adding an extra layer of protection for the aerial insertion. Standard armor, while offering superior mobility, lacked the sheer defensive power of the Terminator plate. 
these shields would prove invaluable in the close quarters combat that likely awaited them on the surface. A deep rumble echoed through the deck as ammunition pallets rose from the underbelly of the ship, their ascent heralding the imminent commencement of the airborne assault. The Space Marines, each a paragon of martial prowess, stood ready. The fate of Sarah too hung in the balance, and they were the Emperor's chosen instruments of redemption. Servitors clad in utilitarian uniforms, assisted by lumbering mechanical thralls, distributed ammunition with practiced efficiency among the gathered Space Marines. The air crackled with a sense of focused purpose as each warrior meticulously inspected their armor and weapons, ensuring their tools of war were battle-ready. Chaplains, clad in their crimson robes, walked amongst the ranks, their voices heavy with conviction as they listened to the oaths sworn by the Space Marines. These oaths, symbols of unwavering loyalty and dedication to the Emperor, were then permanently marked upon their armor with a hiss of hot wax and the searing imprint of a holy seal. Years of rigorous training had honed a machine of perfect efficiency, every member, from the mighty Space Marines to the tireless servants, performing their roles with flawless precision. A disembodied voice, barely audible above the din of preparations, crackled through the Vox channels, the glorious Macrag has entered planetary orbit. Airborne deployment commences in ten minutes. The Space Marines, their enhanced hearing filtering out the background noise, received the order with stoic acknowledgement. A sudden, deafening blare from a klaxon echoed throughout the deck, instantly silencing all activity. Space Marines and servants alike snapped to attention, their gazes fixed with unwavering devotion towards the arch leading to the bridge. A hush fell over the room as a figure of immense stature emerged, his azure armor of destiny gleaming under the harsh overhead lights. Gilliman, the Primarch of the Ultramarines, Regent of the Imperium, and son of the Emperor, strode forward with a purpose that commanded absolute respect. He was flanked by his elite glory guard, their presence a potent symbol of imperial might. Gilliman's gaze swept across the assembled warriors. His left hand, adorned with the imposing gauntlet of the Dominion Hand, rested on his hip. At his waist hung the silent Emperor's sword, a weapon as legendary as its wielder. The sheer force of his presence made the mortal servants hold their breath in awe. His voice, deep and resonant, boomed through the chamber. Are you ready? The first company commander of the Dawn Star chapter, his voice ringing with pride, responded, My lord, everything is in place. From the Ultramarines, Sicarius, captain of the second company, echoed the sentiment. We await your command, my lord. The other space marines stood ramrod straight, their eyes filled with veneration and unwavering loyalty. For these warriors, Gilliman was a beacon of hope, a symbol of the Imperium's unwavering resolve. Their admiration shone brightly in their gaze a testament to their willingness to give their very lives for this legendary figure. Gilliman's lips pursed into a grim line. Excellent, he declared, his voice firm and unwavering. It is time for the traitors to face the consequences of their rebellion against the Imperium and mankind. The Emperor will not suffer their defiance. Victory shall be ours. A chorus of roars erupted from the Space Marines, their battle cries drowning out the surrounding clamor. Victory. They bellowed, their voices shaking the very foundations of the ship. Sicarius and his squad were loaded into a drop pod, a steel capsule designed for rapid atmospheric entry. With a deafening roar, the drop pod was ejected from the glorious Macrag, propelled towards the surface of Sarah II like a fiery meteor. This was the standard deployment tactic for space marines, a brutal yet effective way to inflict immediate damage on the enemy through the force of impact. Gilliman, along with another contingent of space marines, boarded a Thunderhawk gunship, a heavily armed transport vessel. Their descent would be a more deliberate affair, allowing for a more strategic deployment of their forces. The fate of Sarah II hung in the balance, and the Space Marines were about to become the Emperor's instruments of vengeance. The sheer size and bulk of the Primarch and his Terminator brethren rendered them incompatible with the cramped confines of the drop pods. Their deployment necessitated the utilization of a more substantial airborne vessel, the mighty Thunderhawk gunship. Sarah II, choked by a sickly green miasma of plague gas, loomed ahead. The drop pods, resembling fiery cannonballs, hurtled through the swirling pestilence, their descent rapid and unforgiving. Forty seconds, warriors, prepare for battle. Sicarius roared over the intercom as the drop pod sliced through Sarah's atmosphere. A howling wind tore at the armored vessel, the sound relentless assault even through the thick bulkheads. Undeterred, the space marines maintained a stoic silence, their focus honed for the coming combat. As the atmosphere grew denser, the drop pod's descent accelerated. Rockets at its base ignited, spewing out a torrent of white-hot flames as it plunged toward the ground. The craft shuddered violently, 
the interior heating up rapidly under the fierce friction. The entire drop operation was a tightly orchestrated ballet of speed and fury, a descent from the void to the battlefield in a mere five minutes. For ordinary soldiers, such a violent impact would be a death sentence. Their bodies simply wouldn't withstand the punishing G-forces. But the Space Marines were not ordinary. Their enhanced physiology and power armor rendered them impervious to the forces that would shatter lesser beings. This brutal airborne insertion was a testament to their formidable power. Sicarius fought to control his anticipation. The roar of the descent filled his ears, drowning out any potential communication with his squad mates. He was a warrior in a steel cocoon, isolated from the impending battle. Unlike the elegant deployment offered by the Stormbird, this was a crude but effective method. Gilliman's decision to utilize drop pods wasn't simply a matter of practicality. There was a strategic element in play. Dropping directly into the enemy's rearguard without warning would unleash a devastating psychological blow. This sudden descent, this unexpected arrival, would tip the momentum of the battle in their favor before the enemy could even react. A deafening boom shattered the tense silence as the drop pod's hatch exploded outwards. The restraining belts securing the Space Marines snapped open, and in a flurry of controlled movement, they found themselves standing on a traitor artillery position. Chaos cultists, their bodies adorned with blasphemous sigils, stared in stunned disbelief at the figures that had materialized before them. Before they could even comprehend the situation, a shockwave erupted from the drop pods landing, tearing through their ranks. Some were flung aside, broken bodies tossed like ragdolls. Those unfortunate enough to be caught in the immediate vicinity were obliterated, their flesh and blood splattered across the desecrated ground. The Gilliman, Sicarius roared, his power sword crackling with sanctified energy. He leveled his bolter at the remaining cultists, their faces contorted in a mix of fear and rage. The battle was upon them, and Sicarius, along with his squad, met the enemy head-on with a righteous fury. 22. Desperation amidst the inferno and choking fog, Sicarius and his fellow loyalists emerged from their drop pods, blades bared and bolters roaring, ready to join the fray. His power sword hummed with a malevolent energy as he cleaved two cultists in two with a single, brutal swing. Turning with deadly grace, he charged towards a plague marine wielding a rusted bolter. The foe attempted to unleash a volley of fire, but Sicarius, renowned for his exceptional swordsmanship and battlefield awareness among the Ultramarines, effortlessly dodged the hail of bullets. Drawing upon the blessings of his power armor, he bridged the distance between them in mere seconds. He ducked beneath a clumsy swing of the Plague Marine's rusted cleaver, a last-ditch attempt to parry the inevitable. Sicarius's backhand strike was a masterpiece of lethal efficiency, a clean, brutal slash that carved a gaping wound across the Plague Marine's bloated abdomen. Shock contorted the Plague Marine's face as it stared down at its own viscera. Before it could even contemplate its demise, Sicarius struck again, severing its head with a single, decisive blow. The decapitated monstrosity collapsed with a dull thud, its bulging eyes wide with disbelief. From the gaping wound, a torrent of fetid pus erupted, teeming with squirming maggots. Wasting no time, Sicarius snatched up a fallen bolter and unleashed a vengeful torrent of fire. The bolt round slammed into the chest of another traitor the outdated armor no match for the explosive projectile. A geezer of foul-smelling pus and maggot-infested flesh erupted from the impact point. The Plague Marine's chainsaw sword, still encrusted with gore, clattered to the ground. The eyes embedded within its hilt seemed to flicker with a flicker of horror as its silent scream was cut short. Without a host, the demon inhabiting the weapon would soon fade into nothingness. Sicarius and his squad stormed the artillery position, their battle cries echoing across the battlefield. For the Lord of Ultramar, Sicarius roared, his bolter spitting bolts with deadly accuracy, targeting the enemy's artillery and plague blasters. For the Lord of Ultramar, his brothers in arms echoed, their bolters adding to the cacophony of war. Explosive shells slammed into the enemy artillery, detonating the ammunition housed within the barrels. Secondary explosions ripped through the surrounding area as shells and energy modules ignited in a chain reaction, transforming the artillery position into an inferno. Plague blasters not obliterated by the initial onslaught were quickly consumed by the flames, their tortured screams echoing amidst the chaos. Within moments, the once formidable artillery position lay in smoldering ruins, a testament to the swift and brutal efficiency of the Space Marines. Primary objective complete, Sicarius relayed via Vox. Now, execute secondary objectives, eliminate remaining hostiles. We flank the enemy and support the main advance. There were few Plague Marines left to contend with. 
The majority of the enemy force consisted of gullible cultists, duped by the promises of chaos, or craven souls who bartered their souls for a fleeting reprieve from mortality. The cultists, a rabid horde brandishing a grotesque array of weapons, charged towards the space marines in a frothing mass. Their faces, twisted with fanatic devotion to chaos, bore the marks of heretical tattoos. Sicarius met their charge with unwavering resolve. His power sword sang a deadly song as he cut down those who dared to oppose him. Mortal cultist or plague marine, all fell before his relentless blade, their heads tumbling to the dust in a grim ballet of death. The minions of chaos met their demise at the hands of Sicarius and his brothers. Bolt rounds punched through frail bodies, and power weapons carved swathes of destruction. Yet, maddened by the promises of chaos, more cultists poured from the woodwork, their numbers seemingly endless. Unfazed, Sicarius and his squad pressed forward. The battlefield churned into a grotesque tapestry of blood and gore, limbs and shattered weapons littering the ground. The azure of their power armor, once a symbol of purity, became a canvas of crimson testament to the carnage they had wrought. Moving with practiced efficiency, the loyalists formed a deadly web of firepower, their bolters spitting death at any who dared to resist. The tide slowly turned as the most zealous chaos champions fell. Only a desperate few remained, throwing themselves at the space marines in a futile attempt to break their unwavering line. Others, their courage broken, sank to their knees, whimpering pleas for mercy. Please, a woman begged, her voice cracking with fear, I just want to live. Sicarius' gaze remained cold. For chaos, there is no forgiveness, he declared. Death serves as a mere inconvenience to the emperor's enemies. Your choice has condemned you. Your flesh will be consumed, your soul banished. Die, traitor. A bolt around roared from his weapon, the woman dissolving into a mist of gore under the explosive impact. Sicarius showed no mercy. Kindness towards chaos scum was an insult to the loyalists who had already fallen. The remaining traitors met the same fate, dispatched by bolter fire, power weapons, or the crushing blows of the space marine's iron fists. Soon, the ground where they had knelt became a macabre tableau of blood and broken bodies. With the artillery positions neutralized, the plague marine's anti-air defenses lay in ruin. Now, stormbirds, thunderhawks, and other combat aircraft screamed through the plague clouds, unleashing a devastating bombardment upon the enemy lines. Space marines rained from the skies, ready to join the fray. Even more terrifying engines of war lumbered into battle, dreadnoughts, super-heavy tanks, night titans, and the awe-inspiring emperor titans. Their combined firepower unleashed a torrent of destruction that the plague forces could not hope to withstand. The tide of the battle had shifted decisively in favor of the Imperium, thanks to the intervention of Gilliman and his space marines. Victory, it seemed, would soon be theirs. Meanwhile, on the other side of the conflict, the plague marines and their cultist allies pressed their final assault upon the besieged fortress. Gurlo, a corpulent monstrosity clad in plague-ridden armor, stood amidst the ruins of the fortress like a grotesque statue. Fat flies buzzed incessantly around him, disturbed by his every movement. Before him lay a gruesome tableau, mounds of corpses, each a feast for the swarming flies. He held a vial of vile, shimmering liquid, a conduit for channeling the corrupt power of Nurgle. A cruel smile twisted Gurlo's features as he gazed upon the distant figures of their humans, their screams echoing through the ravaged landscape. It nears completion, he rasped, his voice thick with satisfaction. The warp ritual nears its climax. Soon, Gilliman will arrive to find his efforts wasted. This planet falls to the embrace of our father Nurgle, and these pathetic souls shall join the ranks of the blessed. From within the crumbling fortress, Commissar Gion's voice rang out, a defiant roar echoing through the din. His elite guard, armed with carbines and burst rifles, unleashed a hail of fire upon the advancing enemy, a tide of shambling plague-ridden corpses. Gion, though aware of the near-certain defeat, refused to succumb to despair. He wouldn't waste his life in a futile charge, his priority was the civilian's safety protect the civilians, he bellowed, guide them west. Hundreds of men and women, clad in the tattered uniforms of the Imperial Guard, rallied around Gion's position, their resolve unwavering despite the grim odds. Their faces, etched with the harsh realities of war and plague, bore the marks of hardship. They knew the inevitable fate that awaited them, a lingering death from the plague's insidious touch. Yet, they stood firm, their courage a beacon of defiance in the face of overwhelming darkness. For the Emperor, their battle cry echoed across the battlefield, a defiant chorus amidst the chaos. A lone soldier, a woman overwhelmed by a plague-ridden monstrosity, fell with a final prayer on her lips. 
In a desperate act of defiance, she clutched a high-energy grenade and detonated it, the resulting explosion a horrific blossom of fire and flesh. The blast zone, a radius of ten meters, was instantly cleared of both the living and the undead. Witnessing the sacrifice, Jian muttered a silent prayer. May you find peace, soldier. May the Emperor's light guide your soul. His laser pistol continued to spit death at the encroaching tide of plague and cultists, all the while directing a slow, strategic retreat. A heart-wrenching cry pierced the din, a child's terror mingled with the pained voice of an old man. Turning towards the sound, Jian's gaze fell upon a horrifying scene. A wizened old man clung desperately to a cultist's legs, his face etched with grief. Beside him lay a young boy, his head fractured, blood pooling around his lifeless form. A little girl, tears streaming down her face, stumbled towards the fallen figure. Enraged by the sight, Jian wasted no time. His laser pistol erupted in a burst of fire, felling the cultist. He then rushed towards the remaining child, scooping her up into his arms. While the sentiment behind the ending is interesting, it unfortunately breaks the immersion of the Warhammer 40k universe and introduces commercial elements. Here's a more fitting conclusion. Jian, the weight of the girl a crushing burden in his arms, grappled with a horrifying realization. Even if he saved her, the reprieve would be fleeting. The world was ending around them. A thunderous explosion rocked the battlefield, the bodies of two soldiers stationed near him erupting in a gory mist. Two plague marines, their corrupted power evident in their bolters that harvested lives with chilling efficiency, emerged from the smoke. These were once loyalist tarts. Their formidable combat prowess a chilling testament to their fallen grace. For ordinary soldiers like Jian's men, they were harbingers of swift and brutal death. Heavy footsteps pounded the ground, heralding the arrival of a monstrosity even more horrifying, a flesh and blood dreadnought, its mechanical form warped and infected by the plagues of Nurgle. Despair clouded Jian's vision. His remaining soldiers, heroes in their own right, were simply outmatched against such foes. A booming voice, dripping with malicious glee, echoed across the battlefield. Foolish servant of the corpse emperor, a plague marine sneered, embrace the gift of our loving father, Nurgle. Suddenly, a shadow fell upon them, a dark blotch rapidly expanding across the ground. The plague marine, confused, looked up, his pupils dilating in a flash of recognition. A colossal figure, its golden armor ablaze, plummeted from the sky, a flaming sword held high. With a roar that shook the very foundations of the battlefield, it descended upon the plague marine, the blazing blade cleaving the traitor from head to toe in a single, brutal motion. I have come, the towering warrior bellowed, his voice resonating with a power that dwarfed even the din of battle. Hope, flickering like a dying ember, rekindled within Jian's heart. Help had arrived, and perhaps, just perhaps, there was still a chance for victory.23. Hope. The newcomer stood like a mountain cleaving the sky, his form radiating such immense power that it seemed to warp the air around him. His voice boomed like a thunderclap, a force of nature that sent shivers down the spines of even the most hardened warriors. He was a legend made manifest, a demigod striding from myth into the mortal realm, driven by compassion for the suffering of mankind. The size disparity between this colossal warrior and any space marine was as vast as the gulf between a space marine and a groveling mortal. His azure armor, gleaming with the brilliance of hope, cast a calming light upon the battlefield, easing the desperation that had gripped Jion and his men. The craftsmanship of the armor was evident at first glance, a testament to the tireless ingenuity of the Mechanicum's greatest minds, forged from millennia of accumulated knowledge and brimming with advanced technology. Runes etched across its surface pulsed with arcane energy, and the centerpiece of the breastplate was a magnificent golden imperial double-headed eagle, adorned with sheaves of wheat, a symbol of humanity's enduring spirit. A white cloak billowed majestically behind this awe-inspiring figure, a stark contrast to the halo of light emanating from his entire being. The face visible above the breastplate was a study in stoic authority, sculpted to perfection like the work of a master artist. It held a chilling aloofness a power that demanded respect even in repose. The iron halo hovering above his head, emblazoned with the holy symbol of the emperor, further emphasized his untouchable divinity. This god amongst mortals descended from the heavens in a blur of motion, his flaming sword cleaving the plague marine in two with a single, effortless swing. The display of power stunned and terrified the enemy ranks. His arrival heralded victory, a beacon of hope piercing the encroaching darkness. The sheer force of Gilliman's landing sent tremors through the ground, causing the cultists to stumble back in a wave of panic. Many traitors, their hearts pounding with primal fear, fell to their knees before this divine warrior. 
his presence was a suffocating weight, stripping them of their courage and leaving them trembling wrecks. Gilliman swept his gaze across the battlefield, his majestic eyes glinting with an inner fire. A silent lament flickered within him, a pang of sorrow for the power squandered by the traitor Primarchs and the devastation they had wrought upon the Imperium. At an impossible altitude of 1600 meters, Gilliman had launched himself from the sky with impunity, a testament to the resilience granted by the armor of fate. He was a paragon of physical perfection, a demigod amongst men. Here, in the grim tapestry of war, the ideals he embodied clashed with the horrifying reality of endless conflict. The enemy's firepower, unleashed in a desperate attempt to bring him down, foundered harmlessly against the shimmering energy field that enveloped him. Their artillery shells detonated in impotent fury, leaving only a brief, flickering display of defiance against his unwavering presence. The plague dreadnought, a monstrosity of flesh and metal, roared in fury as its massive cannon boomed, spewing forth a torrent of destruction. But Gilliman stood resolute, a storm unswayed by a passing breeze. The battle had taken a dramatic turn, and the tide was now turning decisively in favor of humanity. Dauntless, the traitorous champion, launched a series of attacks against Gilliman, but they were as futile as a gnat buzzing against a wall. The Primarch's defense was an impenetrable wall of steel. Die. Traitor, Gilliman roared, his voice a thunderclap across the battlefield. The Emperor's sword, a blade wreathed in righteous fury, pulsed with an ever brightening golden flame. The assembled forces watched in stunned silence as Gilliman charged towards the lumbering dreadnought. With a single, awe inspiring strike, he pierced the monstrous construct, the golden flame licking across its surface like a living entity. A scream, laced with both pain and defiance, echoed from within the dreadnought's sarcophagus. Dauntless, the Plague Marine champion entombed within, witnessed his own doom as the fire spread, consuming not only his corrupted flesh but the very metal shell that encased him. The dreadnought's grotesque form writhed in its death throes. The flesh of countless maggots feeding within its innards sizzled and blackened in the heat, turning to ash. The once proud alloy armor, impervious to most weaponry, melted under the inferno unleashed by the Emperor's sword, reduced to a bubbling mess of molten iron. Jayin, still clutching the little girl, stood transfixed, unable to tear his gaze away from this godlike warrior. The battlefield had been a scene of despair mere moments ago, yet now, hope bloomed anew. A sudden whoosh tore him from his stupor, a thunderhawk gunship roared overhead, its weapons blazing. Burst cannons spat streams of fire, while the auto cannons raked the ground, suppressing the remaining cultists and traitors who fled in panicked cries. The gunship's path left a trail of explosions, cleansing the battlefield with righteous fury. High above, storm birds thundered across the sky, unleashing a devastating carpet bomb attack. Lances of radiant energy pierced the choking plague clouds, striking the enemy with pinpoint accuracy. Each detonation left behind a scorched crater, a testament to the overwhelming firepower of the Imperium's aerial might. From despair to elation, the tide of battle had shifted in a heartbeat. Jiayin, overwhelmed by the rapid turn of events, squinted towards the figure clad in azure armor. A flicker of recognition sparked within him, a vague memory of seeing this majestic face upon an effigy of the Emperor himself. Is he, an angel of the Emperor? The little girl whispered, her voice barely a breath. She pointed to the colossal warrior who, with each swing of his flaming sword, brought order to the battlefield chaos. A jolt of clarity struck Jiayin like a bolt of lightning piercing through fog. Primarch, he stammered, the word tumbling from his lips. Primarch, a son of the Emperor, the true Lord of Ultramar. Recognition dawned, stripping him of coherent speech. The other soldiers mirrored his shock. The Primarchs, those legendary figures of power and wisdom, had faded into myth after ten millennia. Much of history had been lost in the relentless march of time, leaving only whispers and fragmented truths. Many doubted the very existence of these godlike warriors, dismissing them as mere figments of a forgotten age. But now, all doubt lay shattered. Here, before their very eyes, stood a living embodiment of those myths, a primarch, returned to deliver salvation. These warriors, as legend foretold, were unstoppable. Any who dared oppose them faced swift and utter annihilation. A surge of elation washed over Jiayin, the despair and fear that had gripped him moments ago dissolving completely. Counter charge. He roared, his voice hoarse but filled with renewed vigor. Reverse charge. All troops within earshot, execute this order. We counter charge. Victory is ours. He bellowed the commands with all the strength he could muster, directing his orders to any available channels. Having issued the commands, Jiayin readied himself to join the charge, his hand tightening around his command sword and pistol. 
Victory beckoned, and with it, glory. A violent cough erupted from his lungs, the pain so excruciating it felt like he were hacking them out. His body, drained beyond its limits, felt impossibly heavy, every cell screaming with exhaustion. He sank to his knees, his strength sapped, unable to even stand. Are you all right, sir? A nearby guard blurted, worry etched across his face. Jian attempted a reply, the words dying in his throat. A mouthful of blood erupted from his lips, and he crumpled backward, his vision blurring. Medic. We need a medic here. One of the guards cried, his voice tinged with desperation. This way. Hurry. Through the haze of fading consciousness, Jian heard the panicked voice of the little girl, her words muffled but clear. Uncle, don't die, uncle. The little girl's tearful touch shook Jian's fading awareness. Rough hands lifted him, depositing him onto a surface that felt both hard and yielding, a stretcher, perhaps, or a troop carrier. Disoriented, his perception of the world narrowed to fleeting impressions, sounds and sensations. Cries mixed with shouts filtered through his clouded mind. A bittersweet comfort settled in his chest, he wasn't alone. Someone, at least, would mourn him. His thoughts, once a torrent, slowed to a sluggish trickle. The effort of thinking was a monumental struggle. One final, hazy thought flickered across his fading consciousness. Benevolent Emperor, forgive my failings, grant me passage to your eternal realm. With a final prayer, Jian surrendered to the encroaching darkness. Meanwhile, Gilliman strode across the battlefield, an unstoppable tide of righteous fury. None dared to stand in his path, each enemy who attempted to do so meeting a swift and brutal demise. The Primarch's arrival heralded victory, an absolute and unyielding triumph. My lord, a voice broke the thrumming silence. It belonged to the chief strategist of the Aurora Star War Group. We're detecting extremely potent warp fluctuations emanating from that direction. Reality itself seems to be weakening. The enemy's ritual must be taking place there. Gilliman followed the pointed finger, his gaze penetrating the swirling miasma of plague clouds that shrouded the ruins. A prickle of unease crawled down his spine. Lead the way, he commanded, his voice a steady baritone. Words were unnecessary, his raised sword was a clear command for the other warriors to follow. Ending the enemy ritual was paramount. No matter the cost, the warp rift had to be sealed.